Today's a really, really great day to have a great day. Come on, look at the person next to you and smile real big. Come on, you can't, you can't have a bad day when somebody's just like this at you. Come on, give him that Joel Osteen smile. Just that. Come on, he's the nicest guy I've ever met. Come on, just like this. Like, look at your second choice and just show him. Say, hey, I don't care if you're not going to smile back. I'm going to smile real big today. It's a really great day to have a great day. Because note to self, if you're taking down notes, which we always encourage you to, if, if you ever thought that you were convinced that you couldn't go on, I'm telling you, you're still standing. And everything you're believing for is right on the other side of you not giving up. Come on, single folk. Uh, uh, right on the other side of you not giving up is that, is, that, is that significant other. Right on the side of you not giving up is that breakthrough. Come on, right on the other side of you not giving up, I'm preaching already, is that significant shift and change in your life. So I just decided to wake up and believe that this is the day that the Lord has made, and I refuse to not rejoice and be glad in it. High five the person next to you and say, he's already all, all the way in, like we're already starting. Hey, come on, pray, and then we're going to jump into week number two of Starter Kit. Father, I thank you that you give us ears to hear you. We need a heart ready to receive. And most importantly, God, we posture and position ourselves open-handed so that you can pull weeds today in areas that are smothering out good fruit, and we just want to keep growing. Forgive us, God, for getting in the way. God, as we learn more about the essentials of faith, generosity, legacy, God, I pray today, Lord, that we'd have a mind ready to understand all that you have for us in Jesus' name. Come on, if you believe it, say amen. amen. So in this series, The Starter Kit, I just said it, but we're, we're talking about faith. We're going to talk about generosity. We're going to talk about purpose and the assignment on our lives. And how many of y'all were in the room last week when we streamed Pastor Robert Morris's message? Okay, great. 16 of you. It was a good word. Something that stood out to me was when he talked about how we are born with sin nature, we know this, and they use the example of the parents who realize very quickly, like, where did all this anger come from in this sweet little baby? But the truth is, God sent Jesus, his only son, to clean up the rest, which is us. He redeemed the rest, and we talked about the principles, not legalism, not coercion or forced giving, but the principles of sowing and bringing your tithe it's a great word for week number two. We're gonna continue in the track of the starter kit. Uh, I was digging through some stuff. I had a tool starter kit. How many of y'all have ever had a starter kit with something? Like somebody gave me a tool set. It has the Phillips and the flathead and like this makeshift wrench that's also a hammer. It's everything. It's all in one. Uh, and there's all these starter kits, and that's what the series is about. It's a foundation of essential items that we need to grow in the things of God. But anytime, statistically, there's two things that we talk about that people don't like to talk about. Statistically, people don't like to be told what to do with their money. I heard a, ooh, I could just hear in the room. And people don't like to be told what to do with how to raise their kids. <laughs> where's, where's all the parents at? You guys, I'm like 17, 18 year old that doesn't have kids. They're like, I don't know why you're doing that. I don't know why you're doing all that. You're like, you don't, uh, you don't even have any kids yet. Leave me alone. So statistically, they say there's two things that people don't like to be told what to do. Because maybe the mindset, or maybe it's been ingrained in you, that every church is all about the money. Every pastor at some point in the year, and you try to time it so you don't have to be there on that weekend. <laughs> You're laughing because it's true. <laughs> Like, let me try to gauge the series. Oh, they tried to sneak it in with a fancy series title. No, but the truth is, in the past, and I know I've also experienced this, people will twist and use money and resources as a means of manipulation. I can say this with all sincerity. You will not get that here. This is not about legalism. This is about the principles of the word, and we truly believe as we talk about it and we unpack it, God will unlock favor and blessings in abundance in your lives. Can somebody say amen? amen? So this is my prayer throughout this entire series, specifically last week and this week. Don't disconnect. Come on, shout out loud. I'm gonna stay plugged in. Come on, say it out loud. Elbow the person next to you and say, wake up. Come on. Because throughout this series, we want you to catch that God's not trying to get something from you. The church isn't trying to get something from you. Hope City and God is trying to get something to you. So many times there's this misconception that it's just take, 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 but we believe deposits are made 
purpose is gonna come alive. So number one, we don't like to be told what to do with our money. <laughs> number two, we don't like to be told what to do uh, with parenting. And uh, everybody's parenting techniques is different. Uh, I was raised just different. I was raised country. Uh, now you're, you know, I'll be at HEB and, and I'll hear a mom go, Cody, don't, uh, don't make me count to three, Cody. One, Cody. One and a half, Cody. Two, Cody, don't make me get to three, Cody. Two and a half. Two and three quarters, Cody. If I get two a little bit after three quarters, Cody. See, mom, I was raised where my mom's like, if my mouth even forms the, the number one, I'm over there. I'm coming at you. Where's all the... <laughs> so parenting techniques are different. I remember my wife, my wife and I first got married. Uh, Jackie and I, we didn't know anything about parenting yet. And so we were around friends who had kids. And I've, I've shared this story before, but it's just so funny. It's a... It's a funny story. Uh, we were at dinner with this couple, and we were talking, and this, this little girl was off the rails, like like, dump, like unscrewing the pepper and dumping it on the table, and the, and the salt. I was like, I think one of them demons jumped out of the pigs in the Bible and ended up in this, this okay, forgive me, I won't say that the next service, but something was not okay. And she was like, do that again, one, two, and I'm like, this isn't working. So they ordered her a hot dog, and as she was about to bite into the hot dog, the hot dog falls off the bun, rolls onto the table, and falls under the table. So I'm like, oof. So I'm trying to get the waiter, like, can you, and the, and the, the mom's like, shh, shh, no. This is my kid, just wait a minute. She digs under the table. She was in under the table, pulling up things that weren't hot dogs, and I said, I found it. We're like, you did, but put it back. <laughs> she was like, <laughs> put it back on the bun and hand it to the little kid. The kid, boom. I was like, oh, that, that's too much for me. It's too much for me. And Jackie and I were like, uh-uh. One day when we, and the, the, the mom said this. She said, uh, listen, I didn't want to cause more of an issue if, if I would have tried to wait. And you know what? That's her parenting technique. Well, things have changed. Now when somebody tries to critique or give my wife advice, she'll say, have you made people? Because I've made people. They call me their leader. It's the craziest thing. I've made my own, I've made my own people. But statistically, we don't want to be talked to about money or raising kids. Good news is we're not going to talk about raising kids. Okay, with that said, I want you to do your best to lean in. I really do. And any maybe church hurt or struggles that you've had around the subject of stewardship, resources, I want you to lay that down at the feet of God and lean in and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you through this series. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. So as we unpack the Starter Kit Week 2, we're going to look at how your time, your talent, giftings, and your generosity starts with the heart. Come on, somebody say out loud, it starts in my heart. Come on, it starts in my heart. We talk about getting off the sidelines. Pastor Matt and Desiree just said it. Go through growth track. Jump on the dream team. Where's all the dream team at? Make some noise. If you've been on the dream team, if you're... On the dream team, we talk about going through growth track, joining the dream team, serving at Hope City, being a part of outreach and missions. And listen, it's never about being coerced or convinced to do it. No, it starts in the heart. Say it starts in the heart. Maybe God's been stirring in you. Maybe it's a subliminal message that I'm wearing our growth track t-shirt right now. But maybe God's been stirring in you to be a part of, not growth track, uh, groups. Maybe God has been stirring in you to be a part of a group. Maybe God's been stirring in you and you didn't do it this semester and he's been asking you to lead a group. It starts in the heart. And when it comes to resources, when it comes to sowing into projects and outreach and missions, generosity starts in your heart, not your bank account. That's just the truth. Because if you're waiting for a specific amount to be in your bank account before you can be generous, then you don't have a heart generosity just yet. I know that steps on some toes, but here's the truth. Listen, God does not bless giving. He blesses the heart behind giving. Right. I'm going to say it one more time. It's about the heart. It's all about the heart. Our prayer throughout this series, though, is that the Holy Spirit will begin to prick your heart and help you identify what's holding you back, what's keeping you from jumping in with both feet. Now, we have an extremely generous church. Some of y'all are like, I'm already in, I already serve, I'm already a part, and that's amazing. But you know, statistically now, across the nation, 
They say that people that are serving in the church is down 45%. They say statistically now, the average church attender is 1.5 to two times a month. I know statistically here at Hope City, it's a couple times a month. Some of y'all are faithful. You're here when the door is open. You're just in the room. You just walk in like you're in. <laughs> but for the rest of the statistics, the truth is 1.5 to two times is real. And most people serve so actually set up to uh, position themselves to be a part of what God's doing, allow God to use their giftings, statistically a lot lower than it, than it used to be. And I believe at Hope City, we're gonna change those statistics. How many of y'all believe that? Come on, I believe. Somebody should shout right there. That was a good moment. All right, we're gonna jump right in. If you have your Bible, I'm actually gonna read uh, out of different translations, but the Amplified's the first one. I love how the Amplified translation of the Bible describes our gifts and purpose and God's plan for our lives. It'll be on the screen. Romans chapter 11, verse 29 says, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. That's good news. For he does not withdraw what he has given, nor does he change his mind about those to whom he gives his grace or to whom he sends his call. So again, God has placed specific gifts, a specific call in each and every one of our lives. Look at the person next to you say, I'm called. Come on, say it out loud. Say, I've been chosen. And this is super important, and I want you to grab this. God did not give you anything he intended for you to waste. That's huge. He did not give you anything he intended for you to waste. If he gave you the ability, he also has equipped you with the capability to walk it out. So no matter what your situation is or where you've been, there's nothing in your life, no gifts, no talents, the resources he's blessing you with. He's never given you anything he intends for you to waste. Underutilized or untapped ability is simply potential. And potential and purpose actually run parallel. The foundation of our ability and capability, I love this, comes from God alone. And this is key, because if you don't recognize your potential, you'll never fully walk in your purpose. Yeah, that's, good. that's good. That's why I... I I saw throughout 2020, the enemy loves isolation. He loves people getting into hiding. He loved people saying, no, 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 I don't wanna be out and around anybody. He loves that because the enemy will try to get in your head that you're better off alone. But all throughout the Bible, if you read just in Acts 2, you see the importance of community. That's why what we do with our time, our talent, our resources are essential for us to truly become who God has called us to be. Because again, God has entrusted each and every one of us with specific gifts and assignments, but it's our choice to remain faithful during the journey. So let's unpack this and talk about faithfulness for a few moments. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 says, let's hold firmly to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Y'all, God doesn't change. I'm gonna say that one more time. God doesn't change. He has been faithful and consistent. When others have ran out on you, when others have abandoned you, when others have lied to you, God doesn't change. He's faithful and consistent. And the Bible has so many accounts of God's faithfulness towards his people. In Genesis 21, he blesses Sarah with a baby in her old age. Some of y'all are like, that's not a word for me. It's okay. <laughs> in Exodus 14, we read where he saved the Israelites from the Egyptians. In Daniel 6, he delivers Daniel from the mouths of the lion. And God's faithfulness was never more astounding than when he delivered all of us from the very grips of sin and he gave us a way to join him in heaven through Jesus. I feel like somebody should give God praise right there. His faithfulness just keeps on chasing us. John 3, 16 has almost become only what we see on a poster board behind field goal post. At a, uh, at a football game, which Alabama lost yesterday. That was a big win for, I don't know that's a big deal for anybody else, but that was good for me. John three sixteen. I saw a guy with the sign. I'm like, well, my God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Somebody say God is faithful. Come on. So that's about God's faithfulness, his faithfulness towards us. But the Bible also talks about how we're supposed to be faithful to God. So what does it mean to be faithful to God, we're talking about the essentials. This is starter kit material. God's faithfulness to his people is not the same as our faithfulness to God. When God is faithful to us, he cares for us, he leads us, and he loves us. 
When we're faithful to God, it means that we trust him to take care of us. We follow where he leads us. We ultimately love him in return. Because being faithful also means that there will be some evidence of our faith in God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5 says, so that your faith would not be based on human wisdom, but on God's power. A faithful Christian, again, walking in relationship, the word Christian means to be Christ-like, will also produce fruit. If you've been around Hope City for any amount of time, you know that I love this verse. If this is your first time with us at one of our locations, you're gonna hear me reference this a lot. I love this foundation verse. This is part of my personal starter kit. John 15, five says, I'm the vine, that's God, you're the branches, that's us. Those who live in me and I live in them will produce, I love this line, a lot of fruit. Not a little bit, not sometimes. You'll produce a lot of fruit, but you can't produce anything without me. And this is what the fruit looks like when you walk in relationship and obedience and you're faithful as a child God. Galatians chapter five, verse 22 and 23. Paul is talking to the Galatians and he talks about the nine attributes of the fruit of the spirit. See, when you walk in relationship with Christ, and you're faithful and obedient as a child of God. Not perfect, because all of us would be disqualified. But when you walk in relationship with him, this is what it looks like, Galatians 5, and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So let's look at it from a practical place. When you're faithful to your word, the fruit of your life is your reputation is that you're an honest person. Oh, no, 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 if he said it, he gave his word, he'll follow through on it. How many of y'all wanna be that? How many of y'all, that's your reputation. You want it to be spoken of you that you're a person of high integrity and character. When you're faithful in character and faithful in integrity, there's actually blessings that follow because these are all attributes of the heart of God. But again, I'm gonna say this with sincerity. We all have stuff. You should go back to week two of the relationship series and watch Pastor Tim Ross unpack your bags because we all have stuff. And God, again, is not looking for perfect people. God is looking for purpose people. Faithfulness does not mean that we'll be perfect. It does not mean that we won't struggle and have moments of poor decisions, but it does mean that we need to continue to trust God and follow his leading when life gets difficult. Come on, if you believe that, say Amen. Because God knows our abilities and our capabilities. He knows that we're not all given the same gifts, talents, and opportunities. Just because you sit in the crowd, you're like, man, I wish I could sing like that. I wish I could do that. But maybe you have the gift of hospitality. Well, what is God unpacking and unlocking in your life? But the truth is because this is so prevalent now, everything's comparison trap. I like the way she does her makeup better than me. I think he's funnier. I, they seem happier. They seem the happiest. They seem, they seem like they've got it all together. And we're looking at everybody's highlight reels and getting caught up in the trap of comparison. I had a conversation with my oldest son the other day. He'll be in, I think, the next service. And uh, we went to Hope City Youth, uh, the Fall Fest. Where, do I have, no, it's 8.30. There's not anybody uh, in here. That, anyways, if you are a parent, of, some, uh, of, a, of a, a student, uh, a, a son or a daughter that's junior high, high school, they, they should not be missing Wednesday nights. I'm telling you, Hope City Youth is incredible. And what God is doing is amazing. Well, I showed up at Fall Fest and they had these, they had these foam glow in the dark like sticks that everybody was like, we had DJ Overflow there, so it was like, mm, mm, mm everybody's in there and I'm in the midst of all of them. I literally got all the way up to the front and I was just in with them. <laughs> I was all the way in. So afterwards, I walked back, and my oldest, who's a little bit more conservative, his approach is less risky. He's standing there, and you know, I'm sweating. I'm like, this is wild. This is great. And he's like, hey, you're sweating. Like, I'm like, I know. And he said, I said, you got to come out of your shell. And he said something. He said, I, I, don't, I don't know that I could ever be like that. And I looked at him, and I said, buddy, you don't ever have to be like that. Me, now integrity, character, all that stuff, but you don't ever have to be the life of the room, party of the room when you walk in. God's called you to be who you're called to be. You're chosen by God. I said, buddy, you've been handpicked and shaped in his image. Some of you, come on, you can clap. 
Some of you have been living a life that feels unfulfilled because you've been so concerned and caught up in comparison. But maybe you'd say, Pastor Daniel, the truth is my life is that of a little ripple right now. It's not a big splash. I don't even know how much impact I'm even making or I could even make. The Bible says in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10, it says, do not despise the day of small beginnings. For the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. He just needs you to take a step. He just needs you to take a step and step out of your comfort zone and be the faithful follower. Maybe God's been asking you to get off the sidelines and be a part. I talk to people all the time out in the lobby. My wife and I will be out there in between services and I'll say, how long have you been in Hope City? 2017. Awesome. Where do you serve? Oh, about that. Um, about that. About serving. Um, I haven't. That's why we want you to know God, find freedom. This part right here, discover your purpose. Why? So that we can all make a difference. What's God been asking you to step out in faith to do? Maybe it's a missions trip. We do them every year. Maybe God's been asking you to serve on the outreach team or somewhere here in Hope City. Maybe God's given you a dream to start a business. Maybe he's asked you to give significantly or give above what you normally give, but because you feel like your money's funny and you don't think that what you would be giving would be even enough to make a difference, I'm telling you, it's enough in the hands of God. You serving, you sowing, you showing up, it's all enough in the hands of God. And maybe some of you have been in the waiting season. Maybe you've been in the season of small beginnings and you feel overlooked and a little undervalued. I wanna encourage you with something. I remember when we were watching, it felt like my wife and I were watching everybody else around us winning. You need to learn to celebrate others in the waiting. Call me crazy, I love to see other people winning. I love to see God doing things in other people's lives. God's timing though for each and every one of us, for our lives is perfect. You just have to wait and rest in the Lord. But here's the truth, when you wait on him and you do it in his timing, his way is so much better. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. All right, we've been talking about the faithfulness of God. I want to shift gears, look at another foundation in our starter kit that we can build our lives upon. I want to look at the principle of stewardship. Some of y'all, you just disconnected. You're like, oh my God, okay. Well, let me just make a reservation. He just said, we're churchy word, stewardship. Here's the definition of the word stewardship. Using God-given abilities to manage God-given resources to accomplish god ordained results. Read it up there again. Using God-given abilities to manage God-given resources to accomplish God-ordained results. Stewardship is ultimately an act of placing items of value in the place where they'll grow best. Some of y'all are just sitting here and you're wondering, okay, I've heard every angle of stewardship. I want you to lock in. I believe this is going to help all of us. I want to look at some areas of our lives that I believe God has called us to be good stewards in, specifically our time, Say time. time. Our talent. talent. That's your giftings. That's your call. And then your resources. Say resources. So God's entrusted us to be good stewards of what he's given us. And there's a season where Jackie and I were first married. So we just celebrated in July 18 years. Come on, make some noise. That's huge. There was a season when Jackie and I first got married where we found ourselves in this cycle what felt like this never-ending cycle that we just couldn't figure out how to be good stewards. We bought stuff we could not afford. I'm not gonna make eye contact right now. We lived beyond our means. We told ourselves that we deserved it, because that's what the world says. And we were over the top stressed out. Can anybody relate to this? Come on, anybody relate? And here's the truth, we felt like we were stuck. We felt like we were stuck on this figure eight cycle of minimum payments and boy, that 90 days same as cash. You're like, you're telling me we can have all new furniture and pay for it later? Hey, man. And then 90 days later, like, hey, do you have some extra money? How are we going to pay for this? But we were in this cycle. Felt like we were in a rut. Two weeks ago, my six-year-old, she really wanted to go to Altitude. It's a trampoline park. How many of you guys have ever been to Altitude? Man, some people have the ability to bounce 
I'm not talking about in life. I mean, on a, on a trampoline, I was dizzy in the first 30 seconds. My wife was just out there. Like she was, we're playing basketball and dodgeball and they're dominant. I looked like I had no business or ability to be out there. And there's this foam pit and they must have just like fluffed it up. So my kids are like, dad, get in the foam pit, get in the foam pit. So I end up jumping in the foam pit and y'all, I couldn't get out. I was like, babe, we've had a good run. Tell the church I love them. Tell my family I love them. Like, like here's our, my life insurance numbers. Like, I was sinking like quicksand. And the foam was like kind of smothering me, but I could kind of breathe a little bit. But every time I would try to take a step, I'd sink deeper. I'm like, babe, I'm for real. She's like, just get out. I'm like, I can't get out. Have you guys ever gotten stuck in the... Okay, y'all are looking at me funny. Go to altitude this week. Do a wild trick and jump in there and let's see... Anyways, I got, I got stuck, and it's so funny because this is what life feels like sometimes. When you end up in this perpetual cycle, and you don't feel like you can get out, and then years go by. They say the days are long, but years are short. Years go by, and you never actually grew past it, so we were constantly complaining that we didn't have enough, we didn't make enough, we needed more money, Yet we found extra to buy the shoes we wanted. I've always had heat on the feet. Like, we figured that out. We figured that out. We, we figured out how to buy clothes. We, we figured out when somebody would call and say, hey, do you guys want to go to dinner tonight? We'd be like, we really don't have the money. Yes, let's, let's, let's go. We figured out how to buy the $5 a day Starbucks drink. Okay, I'm stepping on somebody's toes now. So I went to a leader. We've always been people who have postured and positioned ourselves under accountability. I went to a leader and mentor in my life, and I asked him to help me with the principles of stewardship because we wanted to be more generous. We just didn't know how. We wanted to start tithing and giving to missions and being more apart, but we just didn't know how. And he said, all right, I want to sit down with you. And he sat down and looked at me right in the eyes and said, well, here's the problem. You don't want to hear what I'm about to tell you. And I said, I set this meeting up. Like, what are you, the puppet master? Like, I set this up. And he said, well, let's go to Proverbs 1.7. I said, let's do it. And he said, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. I said, is there any other scriptures you want to go to? <laughs> he said, Daniel, you know the word, but you can't, get, you can't get past yourself. You like the Starbucks cup of coffee. You like the nice furniture. You like having up-to-date clothes. I've never seen you in the same pair of shoes. <laughs> and this is what he said. There's nothing wrong with having nice things as long as the nice things don't have your attention more than God does. As long as you're not tying your hands and holding on to all that stuff and saying, God, would you please release what's in your hands and help me? And he's like, you gotta release what's in yours before I can release what's in mine. He said, let me help you. Your time, your talent, and your money doesn't belong to you anyways. It all belongs to God. That was a wake-up call. It was a wake-up call. This is 18 years ago. Then he spoke into me and he helped us get things into order. And all these years later, I can say that we've broken that cycle off of our lives. We now live within the boundaries of a budget. Some of y'all are like, budget? I didn't know this was a Dave Ramsey's course. Keep going. <laughs> we got really intentional about paying off debt. And now with the help of the Holy Spirit, whenever he nudges our hearts to be a blessing, we feel like we have the ability now to say yes wholeheartedly to the Lord. Because here's the truth. Hear this. God will only give you what you can steward. Some of you know you have self-identified the gift of giving. God has blessed you, and all of us have access to favor. But the truth is, we can't, I preached this during blessing blockers earlier this year, we, we can't stop the blessings of God, but we, sh we sure can block them by getting in the way. God will only give you what you can steward. Luke 16, 10 says it this way, if you're faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. If you're dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. When I thought of stewardship in the past, a lot of times personally in my mind, only thought about money and resources and giving. But giving money to Hope City or a church or charity is not stewardship. It's a part of stewardship. Okay, so if it's not about money, Daniel, then maybe it's about serving in ministry, right? Giving of my abilities. Y'all just want something from me. Again, what you do in ministry for God is not stewardship either. It's simply part of stewardship. So then how do I become a good steward? How do I live a life of stewardship? How many of y'all give your kids allowance? How many of y'all are of the mindset? Not none of you. This is good. Okay, cool. How many of y'all are of the mindset that I allow you to live in my house? Come on. I, I allow you. That's my bonus bedroom that you're staying in. I allow you to, 
you need to clean my fourth bathroom. Like, you need to go clean. That's my other bedroom. Like, I let you sleep in there. Okay, well, anyways, we give our kids, my Finley's sitting on the front row, we don't give them allowance, like, consistently, but we give them allowance for specific things. And we, we want to bless our kids because we want them to, number one, have a little bit of spending money. We give so that they can be a blessing to their, to their friends. We give so that they can learn how to be faithful with a budget. We give so that they can have a little bit of a savings. But ultimately, we give because we want them to have a chance to see what their mom and dad model faithfully, how we've been a blessing and how we bless others. And we want them to have the ability to say, hey, I have a little bit of spending money. We were at the light the other day and there was this girl and my daughter Finley said, Daddy, I want to give, I want to give that lady something. And my first response was, we don't know if that person's being honest. We don't know their story. And I said, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray. But, but okay, you can give. So she dug in her wallet and she pulled out some money. It was her own money. Because she's seen her mommy and her dad model it for a waiter and a waitress and be a blessing to others. True stewardship is a commitment to modeling the heart of Jesus with what God has given you. Some of you have been walking around with giftings your whole life with no idea how to fully use them because stewardship is not merely a decision, it's a reflection. It's a reflection of the generosity that Jesus walked in and maybe you carry a hospitality gift but you've never known where to direct it. Maybe you're a creative who's never found an outlet. Maybe you're a business person but you've always felt stress over what to do with your resources or wealth. Maybe you possess these incredible gifts, but your parents never taught you or weren't present enough to lead you in using these gifts. Because in my experience, and also statistically, giving without direction is often a burden. You guys ever experienced that? Gifting with reflection and instruction is actually a joy. Because when you're taught how to use what you have, you'll love to give what you've been given. So again, the way of true stewardship is simply the act of reflecting Jesus. Come on, smile again real big. And I hope City, we're a church focused on reflecting Jesus. We say it all the time from neighborhoods to nations. And practically, we do this by inviting you to go through the growth track to learn more about who we are so that you can get plugged in, identify your giftings, and ultimately use them to reach more people for Jesus. Because we're a community that wants to make a lasting impact. And our dream team gets to do that. It's not just a ritual or a routine. Our dream team's family. Come on, if your dream team makes some noise one more time. Come on. All right, I'm gonna give you three takeaways. I want you to write this down. Number one, I encourage you to write down notes. If you're here only, you only picked up 5% today. If you write it down, 35% in real time. You've heard me say it before. Some of y'all can repeat it because you wrote it down. And if you write it down, actually go back and apply it. It goes to 90 to 95%. Number one, write this down, stewardship is directly connected to the heart. Proverbs chapter four, verse 23 says, guard your hearts above all else. Why? For it determines the course of your life. Your heart determines your actions and your actions determine if you're a good steward or not. It's not what you give or what you do for God. It's the heart behind why you do it. If you give money and resources to God with the wrong attitude, you're not being a good steward. If you serve week in and week out, you do it with the wrong attitude, you're not being a good steward. The heart behind stewardship is everything. Because the truth is, and we tell our staff this all the time, we don't have to do any of this. Y'all, we get to do this because people matter to God, so they matter to us. Our team showed up, set up chairs, converted a gym into a sanctuary. The team showed up and set all this up because you matter. And we value who you are. And because people matter to God, we want you to love God, love people, and we ultimately want together, we want to change the world. So number one, stewardship is directly connected to the heart. Number two, stewardship is connected, this is key, to every season. Every season. Whether you're in a super lean season or you have it all figured out, stewardship is connected to every season. The misconception is I'll be a good steward when I have it all figured out. I'll be a good steward when I have a lot more money, Pastor Daniel. I'll be a good steward when I've really advanced in my career. I'll, I'll start serving when I have more bandwidth in my time. I'll go on a missions trip when I can fit it in my calendar. The truth is, statistically, the perfect timing never comes. 
Because stewardship is connected to, again, every season of life. I talked to a gentleman in my Bible study, and him and his wife said they, they, they were compelled by the Holy Spirit. They said, let's just give it one year. We're going to start tithing. We're going to commit to generosity. We're going to start serving and sowing. He said, God took us to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth and the first fruits of everything you have. And he said, we made a commitment that day. And he said, I'm telling you, within the first 90 days, God began to breathe on our company. He said, everything that we wanted to give into, everything that we wanted to be a part of, God turned our situation around as we aligned our hearts. Why? Because we were willing. God provided everything we needed so that we could be a blessing to others. He said, we learned what stewardship and generosity really looked like. He said, when we were faithful with our tithe and we were faithful in trusting God with our resources, everything began to change. And he said, the verse that he wrote down and he's living by is Matthew 6, 21. It'll be on the screens. Wherever your treasure is, some of y'all are like, treasure? This is, this is like pirate stuff. This means resources. This also means your time, your talent, your giftings. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. I love the story because if God did it for them, turn their entire situation around, guess what? God can do it for you. Somebody should shout right there. It's true. And it's Bible. Acts 10, verse 34, Peter spoke to him and said, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. God does not show favoritism. God will show you favor. God will show favor to those who are faithful, but never favoritism. We can all, say we can all, walk in supernatural abundance. That's where you should shout right there. I'm telling you, when we're a good steward in every season that we're in, because where your treasure is, you're gifting your time, your resources to really reach and help people, it will be obvious if your heart is in it. Because again, it's all about the heart. So let me ask this loaded question. Are you trustworthy? Can God trust you? Because the world defines success as climbing the corporate ladder, having a nicer house, a nicer car, having, again, everything at your fingertips and disposable, and there's nothing wrong, I said it earlier, with having nice things, but the nice things have you. Because all throughout the scriptures, kingdom success is not what you're accumulating here on earth. Kingdom success looks like obedience. That's a hard pill to swallow. I've said this many times before, and you can write it down, obedience isn't always fun, but it is always fruitful. And when you are obedient to following after the heart of God and the plan of God, he'll bless you and bless others through you along the way. So can you be faithful with what God has entrusted you with? There's a parable in Matthew chapter 25, the parable of the talents. The first man was proven trusted because he had five bags of gold and he wisely gained five more. The second man had two bags of gold and God blessed it and, and he was able to gain two more bags. The third man had one bag of gold and he went, and because he was afraid, in verse 25 of Matthew 25, it said, because I was afraid, I went and buried it. I want you to catch this today. God, our creator, has entrusted each and every one of us with skills and gifts and talents and resources and abilities. But if we allow fear to grip us like the third man, we'll stay in a rut like that foam pit we talked about and never reach our potential and never fulfill our purpose. If you're taking down notes, write this down. Don't bury your potential. Release it and live by faith. Because despite, despite the economic difficulties, the Bible talks about wars and rumors of wars. The life of a steward is a life of hope. Pastor Jackie and I believe, in sitting under wisdom, I said this a, a while ago, whether it's counselors or teachers or mentors or financial advisors, we're always looking to be coachable and teachable. So we give 10% knowing that God will solidify the rest. He can, I can do, if I give him my 10 and I hold on to my 90, he can bless the rest and he can do so much more than if I held on to all of it myself. Because nobody's prepared to advise and shelter you for your future like the one who holds it all in his hands. Come on, can we give God praise just one more time? Because it's easier to hide. It's easier to stay on the sidelines and never jump in. It's easier to just cruise through life on cruise control. But your purpose is not just for you. Your purpose is also about others. We all have a certain window of time here on this earth that we're called to fulfill our purpose and our assignment. And let me say this. If you're breathing, God is not done with you yet. 
Maybe you feel like, yeah, but Daniel, great word for everybody in their 20s and 30s, but I'm in my mid-40s or 50s or even 60s and above, and I feel like maybe I'm washed up. Maybe I don't have an opportunity. If you're breathing, God can still use your yes. The Bible says in James 4, verse 14, it refers to our lives as a vapor or a fog that just fades away. So how are you stewarding it? We love to use words like YOLO. YOLO's not true. You don't only live once. Because this entire thing is about eternity. So when God says, I'll never leave you or forsake you, it's in the now, but it's also in the forever, which gives us great comfort. Side note, when you know Jesus, that when you lose a loved one or someone you have been standing with goes home to be with the Lord, it's not goodbye, but see you later. Because what you do on this earth echoes in eternity in business. I work with and talk with a lot of businessmen in business. We talk about ROIs, return on investment. But when we fulfill our assignments here on earth and we live generously, we have an eternity return on investment. Your time, your resources, they ultimately make a difference on this earth. But I truly believe that there will be people that will walk up to each and every one of us in heaven and say, thank you for sending that missionary. Thank you for going on that mission trip yourself. Thank you for sewing into that project because it reached my brother and my sister. Thank you for buying that building and opening that new location at 5300 West Sam Houston Parkway so that my mom and dad could come to know the Lord. Y'all, people's lives are connected to our destiny, connected to our purpose. And instantly, our mind says, yeah, but I don't have enough to give to make an impact for the building. What I would give isn't significant. While you might not have enough to build out the kids' wings, you might have enough to buy a chair that someone can sit in to hear the gospel week in and week out. Because we're not all called to do everything, but we all are called to do something. I mean, that just caught me. This is why our time and our talent and our resources are so important. So let me ask you these four loaded questions. Does your time honor Jesus? Does your talents and your gifting honor Jesus? Does your obedience in your resources honor Jesus? Does your life reflect and look like Jesus? Because again, I said it a moment ago, God's not looking for polished or perfect people. He's unlocking purpose people. And our dream team is full of purpose people. Why? Because we all grabbed a hold of the understanding of this, Ephesians 6, 7, that we are to serve wholeheartedly as if we're serving the Lord not people, but ultimately our mission is people. Now let me say this, I don't wanna hurt anybody's feelings, but I gotta preach it like I'm feeling it. You might be in here and say, but Pastor Daniel, I, I love this, but I go back to this again. I would love to make time to serve and be a part, but I'm just, I'm just so busy. It's one thing to be busy pursuing the assignment and call of God on your life. It's another thing to simply be chasing fulfillment. Because we can all be guilty of that. Because sometimes we get so busy with things that we're not called to, and it's wearing us out. How many of y'all are just walking around tired all the time? Because the truth is we get busy doing things that aren't our business. And then we just get real tired because I was actually not even supposed to be a part of that. We almost just go through life without full clarity because we're looking only for fulfillment, something to just win at. But what it really is is a pursuit of affirmation that through accomplishing, we find our worth. And ultimately, this is a hamster wheel where we have to perform to feel value. The better thing is to stop with finding our affirmation through climbing these ladders and social media mountaintops, but instead, we're called as sons and daughters to dive into God's presence and find our security into being known and loved by him. Because it's easy to throw everything at a wall to see what sticks, because a lot of times, we're not really committed to the assignment, right? Because if we're not careful, you'll miss out on what God has for you because you're only committed to succeeding and winning. I was at youth last week and I was talking to all the youth and I talked to this one dude. I said, uh, what grade are you? He said, I'm about to be a senior. I said, cool, cool. I said, what do you want to do in life? He said, I want to be famous. I said, okay, I want to be famous. I said, well, let's, let's, pin, let's, let's, let's narrow that down a little bit. Because being famous is not a part of your call or assignment. The world says become rich and famous, but the kingdom of God looks at it differently and says, I want to give you resources 
and influence. And I said, look at me. If God puts great influence on your life and you rise to the top, you have to have the character to keep you there. And then I just dropped a mic. I was like, woo, and dropped a mic. He's like, why did he have a mic? Well, that was weird. But the truth is we're wearing ourselves out, doing things we're not even called to. Look at the person next to you and say, he's not talking about you. It's okay, he's not talking about you. And then look at your second choice and say, I think he's talking about you. I think he was just talking about you. All right, let's talk about time management for just a moment as we're running out of time. Apple introduced a screen time feature. Apple introduced a screen time feature that tells you on your device how much time you spend every day. And you're like, yeah, but I, I, I use my phone for work, but, but you're on TikTok all the time, like for six hours. It's like time management is key because how you manage your time actually proves where your intentionality is. I love this story this older gentleman, I've said this before, but it's a story about an older gentleman who was at the end of his, his career. He had already retired, and he was sitting at this bus stop reading a book, and a 20-something-year-old intern who traveled the same route each day came up to him and said, I, I, I see you reading that same book every day. Is it a really good book? The older gentleman looked at him and said, it's a good book, but I take my time because I don't believe in killing time. I believe in making the most of every moment, experiencing the wonders of life. He said, at my age, I still embrace every moment. He said, if you notice, I'll read a page and look up and just look around the city because I love people. Because even at my age, I can still be growing and still be learning and make the most of my time. And he said, and the things that I have experienced and the things I continue to experience, I can pass my experiences on to guys like you in the next generation. He said, it's a domino effect. He said, I've learned... And I wish I would have learned it earlier, how to not only manage my time, but also my energy. He said, I like this. I like this acronym of the word time. Time, things I must experience. Again, how you manage your time is directly connected to unlocking purpose and the call of God on your life. How you manage your time with your family, how you manage your time between work and relationships, how you manage your time serving and being a part of what God has called you to is all tied to your purpose. So number one, stewardship, connected to your heart. Number two, stewardship is for every single season. And number three, bringing this in for a landing, stewardship is connected to willingness. We have to be willing. God is not a forcer. He will not force himself on you. And you're like, why am I wearing this dream team shirt? I guess I have to serve. No, he's a filler. If you'll make room, he'll fill every time. But a lot of times, this willingness season, this willingness posture, because it's not a season, it's a posture, is super uncomfortable. I've said this before, comfort zones are great because they're comfortable, but nothing ever grows there. You have to be willing to align yourselves to God's plan. God's plan is not just a Drake song. Some of y'all are like, I know God's plan. <laughs> that's the wrong thing. There's a real assignment for your life, and that's where it gets tough, because when you're willing, God will stretch you. He'll stretch you to serve in areas you didn't know you had the ability to serve in. He'll ask you to sow your resources with audacious faith into projects and missions outside of your comfort zone. And when you get your yes out of the way and you place everything in God's hands, you will eventually see God's hand in every area of your life. But it takes willingness. You can clap. It's okay. It's 830. I'm, I'm, I'm ready for it. I want to circle back in landing to generosity for just a moment probably heard this quote before, we make a living by what we get, we make a life out of what we give. And y'all, I wanna brag on you for just a minute. You're a generous church, we're a generous church, whether it's disaster relief or a local outreach or sowing into other ministries, like we say, neighborhoods to nations, like the LA Dream Center across the nation, you guys are incredibly generous. Come on, give yourselves a hand. And what God has been doing through our missions and outreach initiatives are astounding. Here's some summer outreach 2022 stats. I want to throw them up. June to September, we did 55 serve projects. 1,619 of y'all served. That's amazing. 5,447 hours were served. Come on, you can clap. This one's incredible. 80,135 meals served. 9,599 backpacks filled with school supplies given out to kids in the Houston area. Y'all, whether it's local or global, y'all are generous. You're generous with your time, showing up and serving week in and week out, helping people far from God truly know who Jesus is. 
we're a church that looks like the hands and feet of Jesus, but I, I have to say this loaded statement, there's still so much more to do. Number one in most diversity now. We have number one in food, let's go. But we're also number one in murders. Number one in sex trafficking. We're number one in all kinds of things that we should not be. Because there's still a lot of people that need reached. There's still a lot of people that need hope. I want you to mark on your calendar, if you wanna write it in your notes, you can. I want you to mark on your calendar the weekend of December 4th. This is gonna be our end of year legacy offering. And let me explain what it is. It's gonna help us as a church finish strong in 2022 and it's gonna catapult us into 23 with fresh vision for what God has given us going into year number eight, which is no coincidence because the number eight means new beginnings. So this is what we pray. We never ask for a specific amount of Hope City. We ask that you would just simply ask the Lord, Lord, what would you have me give? Prepare your heart and ask God for direction as we sow and come together. Some of you are like, sewing? Like a sewing class? Like, get, okay, giving. As we, as we give the weekend of December 4th, just ask God. The definition of the word generous is liberal, someone who's liberal in giving, one who lives open-handed. A generous heart is a, and a generous life starts with a revelation from God. When you get a revelation from God, it will fuel your dedication to God. Would you close your eyes for just a moment? God, I thank you for this incredible church. We're passionate about reaching the lost. We do this week in and week out because we see a city that needs more of you. We see a church that needs encouraged. We wanna grow, we wanna be discipled. And here's the truth, God, we will never measure our own resources against what's needed here. We measure God's resources against what's needed. So God, we're a generous church, a generous people. We wanna live open-handed. So God, I pray that you would just prepare our hearts for what you have for us, whether it's jumping in and going through growth track, jumping in and being a part of the dream team, jumping in and sowing. But God, we pray ahead of time for this weekend, this weekend of December 4th specifically. We ask God that you would breathe on that weekend and breathe on our church so we can launch other campuses. We can romance even more people to Jesus. We can do more outreach and efforts in our city and around the world. In Jesus' name. I wanna challenge you, look at me real quick, I wanna challenge you. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse eight, that God will generously provide all you need and then you will have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. I wanna challenge you as a church, personally, for you to finish the year strong. If you've never committed to the tithe, if you've never taken that step of faith, I want you to pray about starting this year. If you've never taken a step of faith and searched your heart and committed to radical generosity, I want you to pray about committing this year, finishing this year out strong. If you've been sitting on the sidelines wondering if there's room for me, the resounding answer is yes. I wanna challenge you. I said it before, I'm gonna keep saying it again. Go through Growth Track. More information at the Blue Tent today. Jump on the Dream Team and be a part of the Hope City family. If you're here today with every eye closed, we're bringing this in for a close. The reason we do all of this is for people. I've said it multiple times, but we want, we want people to be known by God because the truth is he already knows you, but you need to know who you are and whose you are. And today I pray that you would recognize that the ultimate act of stewardship is this, that you would place your whole life, your entire being fearfully and wonderfully made in the hands of Jesus knowing that he's the one that designed you and is best equipped to ultimately steward you. Nothing in your life will compare to a life led ultimately by him. Maybe you're here today and you'd say, Pastor Daniel, as an act of stewardship, since that's what we've been talking about, I wanna place my life in Jesus's hands. With every eye closed, nobody looking around for a moment across all of our campuses, I'm gonna give two invitations and I'm gonna count to three. If you're here today and you say, Daniel, the truth is, I don't know Jesus as my savior, but I want to. This is my day. This is the day that I wanna make things right and walk in relationship with him so that I can live my life as a daughter or a son, faithful and obedient to pursuing him as my father. Maybe you're the second invitation. You'd say, Daniel, here's the truth. I, I fell away. I got caught up in the prodigal life. I've been living messy, living pretty reckless, but today's the day I wanna rededicate my life to Jesus. If you're at Woodlands, if you're at Katy, if you're here at West Houston watching online, 
online, just say yes to Jesus. Our team will help you right now. If you stumbled across this on YouTube or you stumbled across this on Facebook, God is getting your attention right now. One, I wanna give my life to Jesus. Two, Daniel, today's my day. I wanna rededicate my life. Three, you're talking to me. Would you lift up your hand? Today's my day. I wanna give my life to Jesus. I'm looking all over the room. I see you over here. Amazing, amazing. I see you. I see you. Come on, let's give God praise right now. Come on, he's faithful and he's good and he's consistent and he's awesome. Come on, let's pray today as a church family. Say, Jesus, it's me. I've been living for me. And the truth is, it's just not working. I lay every mistake, every sin, and all my issues at your feet, and I ask for forgiveness. Thank you for hanging on the cross for my life, even though I didn't deserve it, for getting up on the third day so that I could walk in freedom through resurrection. From this moment on, I choose to live for you. You're my Father, you are my Savior, and you are my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, Hope City, let's give God praise right now.